You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 101. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. This episode of the Artist Athlete podcast is sponsored by the same people who sponsor every single episode of the Artist Athlete podcast, and that's you guys. If you are a Patreon, that is. Patreon allows people to give small amounts of money every month to projects they love, just like this one. So patreon.com slash the artist athlete is the place to give. You can give as little as $3 a month. You can pay it all in one chunk for the year and forget about it until next year. It's a great place to help fund and support artists and projects just like this one. So go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete and sign up to be a Patreon today. There's lots of behind the scenes stuff and secret interviews that I don't release to other places on Patreon. Again, patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is John Gilkey. Gilkey is an award-winning circus performer, actor, director, and teacher. He has performed internationally for more than 35 years in circus, variety, comedy clubs, theater, and television. John's original and quirky routines are known for being an influential part of the contemporary circus movement that began in the 1980s. He's best known for his work with Cirque du Soleil productions such as Iris, Kidam, Dralian, and Verakai. Additionally, John collaborated with the acclaimed director Franco Dragon to create La Reve, a water spectacular for the Wynn Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. As a comedy concepteur, he cast a team of seven clowns and together they developed the comic material for the show. With a budget of over $135 million, this show stands as one of the most spectacular in the world. John's current projects include serving as the founder and creative director of The Idiot Workshop, a series of classes directed to build community by bringing contemporary clown and John's own unique sense of humor to comedians, actors, dancers, and artists of Los Angeles. Since its inception in 2012, over 700 students have passed through the Idiot Workshop. John's performance company, The Wet Hippo, provides a place and infrastructure, infrastructure, that word is hard to say, to support a widening community of performers and makers who value and encourage a shared search for the ridiculous and sublime. Here's my interview with the ridiculously sublime, or should I say sublimely ridiculous, John Gilkey. John Gilkey, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you. Nice to be here. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So before I actually ask you about your life, are you aware that when you Google John Gilkey, the first article that comes up is a Wikipedia article about a prolific book and document thief who has stolen... $200,000 $200,000 worth of rare books and manuscripts. I am aware of that. Yeah. And you knew that. Yeah. yeah. If you do, if you do the image search, you get him and I next to each other. Excellent. And we look nothing alike. Ah, so no relation. No, but I have been, uh, I had people coming after me looking for payment for something that I'm pretty sure was, um, you know, a crime that he committed and they were convinced that it was me who had done it. And that was pretty scary. That's incredible. Yeah. So if I ever find that guy, yeah, I'm telling you, yeah, it's going to be a fight. Yeah, a fight of the Gilkies. The fight of the Gilkies. <laughs> <laughs> We'd both probably just be running, running away, screaming. But um, yes, I know who. I don't know him, but I know I know all about it. I'm glad I asked that question. Then I wasn't sure. Yeah, it's not me. I'm not the book thief. Great. Yeah. Great. Oh, uh, who are you? What do you do? Oh, God. If you're not a book thief. Well, 
I oh gosh, I'm a I <laughs> hard questions here. I know <laughs> who are you? <laughs> yeah, you're starting with a hard one. Um, <laughs> I'm John Gilkey, not the book thief. I, I mean, I guess most people who know of me still think of me as a circus performer, although I haven't really done that in a few years. Um, but yeah, I'm a you know circus guy <laughs> juggler. Did a little bit of acrobatics in, in the way back when, and um, you know a bunch of circ shows, and and uh, now now I'm in LA and I'm, I'm got a little comedy school that I started here in LA, and uh, there you go. That's the long and short of it. Yeah, I actually I kind of want to ask you about your comedy currently and work backwards. Usually on this show I go chronologically. I'm like, how did you get your start? But what did, what is your comedy like now? Is it physical comedy? Yeah. So let's be clear. So I'm not really performing. So when I so when I speak about the stuff that I'm teaching, it's just yes. the stuff that I'm teaching. And yeah, it's it's physical comedy. It's clown type stuff, but not really clown. You know, it's not like <laughs> red nose clown. It's my, you know, it's my experience in circus and clown all jumbled together and then mushed around and then kind of just laid at the feet of these improvisers and actors here in L.A. Basically, I was curious after I was fired from Cirque. I wasn't really fired. I was let go. Back in 2010, 2012, I was here in L.A. And I'm like, oh, what do I do? I'm here in L.A. Don't have a job. Maybe it would be interesting to see what all these actors and improvisers do with all this kind of circus experience that I have, taking the the, the risk factor that, that circus has, whether you're a, an acrobat or a mm-hmm. clown even. I think there's a risk factor that maybe people don't necessarily, that maybe stand-up comedians, for example, or improvisers don't necessarily engage in. Like, yeah, so like, like a, a like danger. A, you know, do you mean like a physical, physical more danger. for us because it's clown and comedy? It's translating physical what would be mm-hmm. physical danger into emotional danger. How do you put your yourself? Hmm. Yeah, that's why I was like interested in the distinction. I guess because I would much rather climb thirty feet in the air than do a stand-up comedy set. Right. Pretty scary. Yeah. Well, imagine imagine that you don't have the structure of stand-up comedy, that you don't have any jokes. Imagine you don't have the structure of improv and you go out on stage and you have to make things work. That's what that's what we, we do wow. uh, at the Idiot Workshop here in LA. It's really relying on who you are, your personality, your strengths, your vulnerabilities, building quickly a relationship with the audience and basically surviving with nothing. It's like walking a tight wire with no net, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, how can you engage the audience in this? How can you create that kind of sense of danger that you have in the circus without actually creating that danger physically, just just emotionally? Right. Interesting. And allowing the public to be a part of it and to right. be to buy into that danger, to be, uh, to be in danger themselves because they don't know what's going to happen. And they don't know if you're going to pull this through or not, if you're going to pull this thing out. Does that make sense? It it. it- it almost does. I have some follow-up questions to clarify it, but I kind of... Are you allowed to tell me why you got fired, let go from Cirque du Soleil? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I like to say I was fired, but it's less Yeah, romantic. it's so much more dramatic. Like, I know. Should we just say fired? Yeah, let's say fired. Who's going to know? <laughs> I was fired from yeah. Cirque du Soleil. Um, Given the chop. Yeah. You know, well, let's see. It was the it was Iris Iris the show that they did here in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there for the creation and for the first year and almost a half I suppose of shows and th- the show had been struggling ever since we opened there were you know the the sales were low and at one point they decided to scale back and uh, you know I mean my I it was it was not my best work that I was had done you know at Cirque. Mm. You know, I, I never really found my place in that show, and I was—I had more—I had seniority, so I was making more money than the average performer. So, folks like me who were expensive and that they could get rid of and save some dough, they cut a bunch of us at once. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't so personal, but sure. it's a bummer that I—I I, I still feel like it's a bummer that I didn't create a stronger character and find a, a more important role in the show that would have been valuable to them. That's a bummer. 
Do you think that's your job? Do you think that's a direction thing? Like what happened? Well, it's definitely a direction thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, what can I say? Um, there was a lack <laughs> of direction. And not only that, but because there was such a lack of direction, I, as there was a team of five of us, sort of clowns and characters, and I was put in charge of kind of coaching slash directing the clowns, which is impossible from the inside, not just because it's, I can't see it and be in it, but also, the, you know, just think about the interpersonal complications. You know, if I put myself above anybody else, or if I put myself in a stronger position, then it looks like favoritism to my, towards myself. So I, it was just, it, it was just impossible for me to for me to find my way. That sucks. Yeah, that's such an awkward position to be in. Yeah, if, if somebody Man. comes to you and says, hey, do you want to be the coach of this gang of clowns and you're one of them, say no. Which I actually, I did say no, but there was no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, okay, you're doing it anyway. Great. Yeah. I mean, I guess if we're thinking about going reverse chronologically, you started your um, comedy studio. Um, and before that, it seemed like you were kind of in a or have occupied a more directorial position for clowning. I saw on I think it's maybe on your website. You call yourself a it's like a comedy conceptua, yeah, something like this. Well, that's what um, when I did the this is backing up even further chronologically. But when I did the La okay. show in Vegas with Franco Dragon, that was the title that they gave me comedy concept or concept to, um it's so fancy i know um it hasn't really gotten me very far but, uh, <laughs> but it sounds good yeah so that like for yeah so i've done a bunch of directing but is there a question i'm supposed to answer i'm sorry i'm just yeah i'm sure there is i should ask it though um how like how do you direct how much of like because i i know clowns and they have kind of their um their it's not an act in the same way that like as an aerialist, I think of my act, but they have kind of their, oh, I don't want to say bit because it sounds really demeaning, no, but they have like things that they do. Yeah. Right. And so as a director of that, like how much are they coming in with, or even you, how much were you coming in with and how much is it the director or you as the director, how much do you shape people? It really depends. Uh, project, mm -hmm. project, it, it varies. Yeah. And it's, it's always challenging. Uh, Interesting. You, yeah. Okay. You kind of, you kind of alluded to this, but it is often a sort of a um, liaison between the the, um, the performer and the show director of uh, trying to communicate um, between them and find, you know, find the middle ground that works for everybody. Often that's the case. A lot of it is is positive feedback and and sharing practical experience. Um, you know, uh, if it's somebody who's new, you know, you have to really try to impress upon them that they're going to have to do this 10 times a week and <laughs> that that requires a certain amount of energy and what have you. Um, and then artistically, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, pushing and pulling and challenging the artist to find to find the moments that that seem to to shine, you know, and and then it's figuring out how to again make that work ten times a week um, to make to find comedy that that's um, consistent, you know. And there's no formula for it. It's it's a super big challenge, and it's a process. So you know, you kind of start figuring it out in, in rehearsals, and maybe six months into the run, the act falls into place and starts to feel like um, feel like it's it's jamming. Interesting. Yeah, I'm always interested in this kind of um, in the time it takes to create something, you know, mm -hmm. um, or the time that it takes to solidify. Like you're saying, like, sometimes an act won't click for six months. But it's like how like I guess it just takes the experience of having something click. Like, how can you know or, or like do th some things hit the chopping block before they're even good? Yeah, for sure. And good that things. was a really poorly phrased question, but I feel like you got where, where yeah. I'm going. I mean, they do. Things get cut quickly and, um, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, just just like that. 
Um, and, but also, you know, you know, good things get cut too. I mean, we mm. when we opened the Lareb show, you know, we had a whole ton of material in the show, and and our peers and colleagues, a lot of people were like super inter- super excited about where we were. They were into it. This was just the premiere. But Stephen Wynn and his wife, you know, who owns the hotel, they weren't into it. So they started chopping away, chip chopping away at that material. And, you know, a few years later, there was nothing left. And so there's a lot of people to please. It's not easy. It's a tough, tough business. Oh, it sounds so tough. <laughs> you have such like an L.A. like I've seen things vibe I've about seen, it all, too. <laughs> I've seen it all now, yeah. <laughs> All shocked. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. So another kind of going back to your initial, like um, getting actors and getting improvisers and getting those types of people to, um, uh, I guess, uh, put your process or put the John Gilkey way on top of. Mm-hmm. Um, w- w- something I think about when I think about your work, first of all, I think about like the incredible physicality you have just because of like your presence, like the way your face is shaped or like your height, you know, like these kinds of things. Mm. Um, and so I'm interested if it's even possible to put like the John Gilkey, I don't want to say mold because obviously it's not a formula, but it is a process. So how do you put that on someone else? Yeah, I don't. In fact, the odd thing is if I were to go out and try to perform what I teach now, yeah, I don't really put myself onto people in the sense of, of my style of performance. It, 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 I, I take my passion, my, my beliefs, my experience, and, um, I, and my, I'm going to say authority for now, my authority, mm-hmm. and I challenge people, performers, actors, improvisers, um, dancers, I challenge them to, to go beyond what they know. So that, that's what I experienced, you know, when I was working, let's say, with Franco Dragon. Um, so I, I take that kind of experience and I give that to the artist rather than trying to shape them in the way that I work. So it's more of an internal process that then is shaped and molded by each individual who brings that process into themselves. And do you have exercises for doing that or what is that what does that process look like? Yeah, well, yeah, there's a whole ton of exercises. Um, like I'm thinking, like like I I was trained. I went to NYU for theater, so I I have like a acting background. And I'm thinking about like one of the first exercises we had to do um, in my experimental theater classes was like a Grotowski based exercise where we would just have to go up in front of the class and just like stand there mm-hmm. for a minute. Yeah, love it. And they just watched you. Yeah, we do that kind um, of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the kind of shit where we're? Yeah, I mean, that we're... kind of stuff. I'll, I'll do like one just that one just that came to my mind now. I like to have people stand behind the curtain so they're off stage, upstage center, and I just have them start yelling out bold statements, just ridiculous bold statements. <laughs> um, and when we get to a good one, one that's like so ridiculous, so absurd, everybody in the audience they start laughing. Well, then I have the person come out and they have to fulfill that bold statement. Um, in whatever way they they can, and of course, it's usually an impossible. It's usually impossible to fulfill this statement, but or this promise, you could say. Promise is a better word for it. You know, I'm going to kiss. I'm going to kiss each and every one of you uh, um, until you bleed. Okay, something crazy like that, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and it, but it doesn't really matter what the promise is. What matters is the attempt. So what I, yeah. So what I try to get people to do is to commit to the attempt. Uh-huh. Filling this promise. And that's so much of what we teach is commitment. So you're an acrobat or an, or an aerialist. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, you have to commit to your moves. You can't, there's no halfway. You can't hesitate. So that's what I mean. No. Like when I was saying earlier, translating what I learned from circus and bringing it into comedy, you have to commit. You have to be there. You have to, to be there for your, for your partner. There's, there's no, 
not being there. Now your partner could be an onstage uh, fellow comedian. It could be the audience. Both of those are partners. In that commitment to the absurd, to the impossible, the, both the vulnerability and the strength of the performer is revealed. And that, mm. in that, there's a sort of a, a blossoming, an emerging of the person as that person. So that's why I say I, I don't teach anybody to do what I do. I take these principles, essentially, that I want somebody to take on, to, to put on to me, to challenge me with. <laughs> you know what I said before about not having a director in Iris. I, if I'd had a director do for me what I'm doing for my students, I, I think I would have come up with something worthy of, of staying in the, in the Iris show. Well, what's so clever about, I mean, like, and I, I had this kind of as a question too, but I wasn't quite sure how to word it. But as you're talking, I'm getting closer to it. Because what I think is so interesting about the exercise you use in this as an example is it's almost like the container that you've created will create amazing contents as long as the person commits, right? Yeah. Like it is the job of the the performer, comedian, actor, clown person to make good on their promise to go out and kiss everybody till they bleed yeah. or whatever. Horrible. Sorry. Um, I don't know why I came up with that one, but yes. <laughs> no, it's great. I'm here for it. Um, but you created the exercise of like, okay, go stand behind that curtain and just make us a bunch of promises or make some bold statements. Yeah. You know, how do you think of these exercises? Are these things that you did yourself? Or are you like taking a shower one day and are like, you know, it would be really funny. Where does that come from? Well, initially, when I first started to teach, I had a sort of a handful of exercises that I'd, you know, experienced over the years mm -hmm. away from other people. But I quickly, um, but, and those were sort of a starting point. As a teacher in the room, I play a character. And so this is, this is uh, I'm not the only one to do this. This is common. But so I, I'll play a high authority character. I'm not like in a costume or anything like that. But I adopt the attitude of somebody with, with high, high authority. So in classic clown, you know, you might have heard people speak about the red and the white, uh, the red clown being the, the, um, the comedian and the white clown being the straight person, um, the straight person. So basically, I play the straight man for for all the red <laughs> comedians in the class. So as that authority figure, I'm in character, I'm in the play, in, in the act of play with with folks. And in the act of play, I'm always discovering. So much of the exercises emerged through the play in the classroom. Not all of them, but many of them did. That's so interesting. It's interesting to hear you say that you are because uh, one would think that these people who are coming to your studio to learn from you, they don't think you're playing an authority figure. They think you are an authority figure. Yeah, they should see me, you know, mope about the house. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I really like. I mean, I have to put on that hat. Mm. For it to be a good class, for it to be a good session, I have to, I have to slip into that character and put on that hat. The days when I I can't find the energy or I can't find the the strength or the um the confidence even. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Those are crappy classes because I'm I'm not doing a good job of driving the class. Um, huh. I'm not committed. Those are the, the, you know, the days that I'm not committed. How can they be committed if I'm not? Ah. Oh, that's so very wise. Yeah, and it kind of leads me it sounds like it's very collaborative. You're that's, just yeah. playing with these people. Yeah. Which is super fun and cool and the fact, like, kind of brilliant that you've set up a world where you can do that. Yeah, and it kind of leads me, how can you be physically funny, I guess, is my <laughs> biggest question. How can one be physically yeah. funny? Uh, that is a good question. Um, Thank you. There's, there's <laughs> some technique to it, for sure, in terms of clarity of movement and where the focus is. Um, you know, there's just a lot of sort of... Um, almost pantomime, you know, technique that, that's really useful. Mask, you know, that's why mask work is so essential. You probably did mask work when you yes. were in college. Yeah. Um, so there's some, there's certainly technique involved. Um, but I think just like everything else, it requires letting go. You know, once you have the technique, 
then it requires that commitment that we spoke of and letting go and, and finding the way that you move ridiculously <laughs> and then owning that. It's really just that. It's, it's not, I don't know how to, I don't know exactly how to describe it other than that. Um, sure. It's just like a, you know, a dancer will put any, you know, will put different, different flavors of emotion, different colors of emotion on, on, on even on the same move and, and get, you know, a different feeling in the, give a different feeling to the audience. It's the same thing for a physical comedian. It's just a matter of fulfilling your emotional drive with your physicality. I'm not explaining it very well. Well, I've realized that I've given you kind of an impossible task, which is to give words to something that like innately just isn't a verbal thing. Yeah. Why are you doing that to me? I'm an asshole. Well, (laughs) (laughs) well, we're talking right now, unfortunately. We're not, we're not even in the Uh, same country. So we can't really, this can't be a video thing where I can go behind a curtain and yell a bunch of words, even though I really want to do that right now. It sounds like so much fun. We teach uh, classes in Toronto sometimes. Do you? When, when we're, when, yeah, when we're back up, you know, when things get back to Absolutely. normal. Absolutely. Come down to Toronto. Oh, I'll be there for sure. Yeah. Um, Super fun. Yeah. But in the meantime. Is there a way to open this up though? Uh, I mean, you're asking a great question. Is there a way that I can shed some more light on that? Oh my God. Yeah. Shed all the light. No, I'm asking you to help me help you. I don't know. <laughs> what? <laughs> is, there, is there another question, a follow-up question that's going to help me? Uh, a follow-up question that's going to help you shed some light on, on the physical economy, how to describe so. physical... Con- well, I think that sometimes the best way to illustrate a point that doesn't have a verbal language to it is to paint a verbal picture of it. Yeah, which um, is horrible at. Oh, gosh. Um, I know. But yes. So like an example of, I'm trying to think, and I'm thinking about like your, uh, like when you created, hmm, let me think, some, one of your acts for Kidam. I'm thinking of the Coat Rack Act, but I know that's not yours per se. It's mine. It's yours. Who told you it wasn't mine? Well, I've seen, um, what's their names? The Slava Snow Show does it. They do not. They do something similar. Hmm. Hmm. I haven't seen that. Where they're like dancing with the coat rack? Uh, they got their arm in it. Check with my lawyer on that. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, man. Artist athlete busted (laughs) up some. (laughs) (laughs) Serious. So when you, so the idea for that, where does that come from? Where Because that's something to me is physically very clever. It's funny. It's engaging. It's it's beautiful. And just as like a comedian would, or like a stand-up comic or a, a verbal, a joke person who tells the jokes would like sit and write jokes and has like a writing process for that. Like what is your, what was your physical process for that? Did you just get a coat rack and a mirror? Did you film yourself? Did you have someone who was like, that's crap? You know, Um, like what what do you do do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I started working on that in the eighties, so I didn't have any way to film myself back then. I didn't even have a video camera or anything like that. And I didn't even have a mirror. Um, (laughs) come to think of it. But that was, so uh, Fred Astaire dances with a coat rack in a movie called Royal Wedding. And that was the first inspiration. It, what he does is different from what I'm doing, but it's a, you know, if you go and you watch it, you'll see the roots of what I do there. Um, so, yeah. you know, shout out to Fred. He's going to come for you, his lawyers. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, just like I'm coming for Slava. What is going on? Um, right. It just get, or just coming for each other all the way down the line. And then and so there, there were many different versions of that act before the version that went into Kidam, and so it was a process of trial and error. And um, but basically, I was you know in my garage uh, just trying stuff out. How does this thing move? I was just a juggler back then. Just <laughs> I was a juggler back then. And so I, I just looked for that relationship uh, that a juggler would look for, like how does this object move and how do I move with it and around it. Eventually, years later, when I learned more about character, I was able to, to bring character to it. And then eventually finding the music for it, which is Ema Sumac, Gopher is the, the tune. When I found that music and started to play with the coat rack and the juggling with that music, then it all just kind of vroom, came together mm. in a, in an afternoon in a really satisfying way. So it was a long process of trial and error 
yeah, eventually I was working in front of a mirror and eventually I would have a video camera access and see what moves looked good and didn't look good and performed it a lot. You know, I'd performed it for years before, before Cirque. So it's so it was, it's, it's, it must've been 10 years or something like that, that I worked on that before I got to Cirque. Wow. I think that's how, that's how a lot of acts work, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, you know, I, I, d- this is very embarrassing, but I, I did know that when it comes to physical feats, again, when it comes to like aerial work or contortionists or those kinds of people, like I know the years, but for some reason, I don't know why in my head, I'm thinking about like clowns and I'm like, oh yeah, you just thought that would be funny. And then you put it on stage. Oh God, no. I mean, the amount of failure and shame that goes into developing a comedy act. I mean, <laughs> you know, prior to it, it becoming to a uh, Prior to it be, be coming to a respectable place where you don't hang your head, you know, and walk <laughs> home in shame. I mean, it just takes years and years for that. That act, the coat rack act, wasn't so bad because it's a, it has a skill base. It's not just comedy. So even, you know, if it, it was never really meant to be a comedy piece, but it, it's, it's humorous, let's say. And even if it wasn't humorous, like if my character, if the play was, uh, the way I was playing was off on a particular night, because I had a skill base to the act, I wouldn't totally fall flat. So that mm. that was uh, helpful. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, this came up earlier, but I, I I mean, I find it takes six months for a Cirque du Soleil clown act to fall into place, and that's ten shows a week. That's wow. if it's a new act. I mean, a lot of people come in. Uh, you know, sometimes people come in with with an act that's ready to go. But if you're doing a new act, oh my god, it just takes time. Sure. Yeah, and I guess in that time it also must just take faith. Right? Yeah, and, that, yeah, like and it, like how many times I think about this again when I'm thinking about any other kind of circus act where it's like how many times can you miss the bar training your salto and just know you're going to catch it one day? Like how many times can you hang your head in shame and just know that someday you'll make the people laugh? Oh, don't go there! <laughs> don't go there! <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's it, you know. It ain't easy. It ain't easy. Mm. Yeah. Do you believe that anyone can be a clown? Most people, yeah. I mean, most people can be funny. <laughs> the, 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 you know, like the, when we get people in class, we get we get people sometimes who have no stage experience. They might be writers or graphic artists or things like that, and they're sometimes just absolutely hilarious. You know, they've got a natural ability. Huh. Well, a natural, let's see, maybe I should say ability, natural, you know, sense of timing. There's something about them that is, you know, charming and engaging, that kind of thing. I think with a good coach, a good teacher, a good director, yeah, I think just about anybody can 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 be pretty fun and pretty funny. But it's a challenge. You know, you gotta tap into that sense of play and, and um we're not we're not always that's not always embraced. Hmm. Can you say more about that? Oh, just you know, in society, basically, you know this. We're 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 all we're all not having any fun. Well, we're taught to be part of a machine. You know, we don't, I don't want to get too political, but uh, you know, there's the man out there. You gotta you gotta serve the machine, and uh, it, it, you know, get your job, have your career, all that kind of stuff. I guess it's hard to it's hard to break out of that if you're somebody who's who's bought into that, and. You're not always encouraged to play. Hmm. You're encouraged to be a part of the system. But that's you probably want to edit that out. I'm sorry. No, don't apologize. I agree. I mean, as a person who fundamentally just hates the system in general and decided to become an acrobat at 20 and instead of getting a normal job after that, started a podcast. I don't know, man. I, I'm thinking about these writers and these people in your classes, and I almost wonder if it's like part of what makes them so funny is watching someone break out of that. Oh my God. You know? I mean, when we, yeah, when we, when, when we get somebody who's making a breakthrough, particularly a non performer, like you mentioned, to see them in, in the course of a, a single class, a, a single day, to see them transform, it's the most amazing thing. Mm. It really, it, I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful to see somebody sort of transcend their, their inner wall, you know, and suddenly, <gasps> begin to play and let go it's it's uh it's 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 remarkable yeah that's so cool 
Do you remember your first, like the first time you got a laugh? No, I was, I mean, you mean like on stage or? Yeah, on purpose. On purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I have yet. Um, I, That's a good point. I mean, I was always funny as a kid. I was certainly always goofy, you know, weird. Were you like a kid who got in trouble in school a lot? Yeah. Were you that kid? Well, yeah. but I was pretty good because I, I was I was pretty good at getting other people in trouble. <laughs> Uh, I could often escape the, uh, you know, detention by, you know, tweaking somebody else and they would laugh or bust out or whatever. And so they would be the one getting in trouble. So, but yes, yes, essentially, yes, I could, I could get into trouble. <laughs> I was the kid who was always getting in trouble for laughing because I laugh so, because I'm the loud person. So, oh, yeah. You see, you'd be the kind of person that I'd get. In oh, my God. With. Every time. And I'm also the person who's like so easily entertained, like magic. Love it. Clowns. Love mm. them. You know, like I, I constantly am just like seeking f to be in trouble. So thanks. Beautiful. Oh, you got to take class. You have such a blast. Oh, my God. Yeah. I'm so excited to do it. And for sure, like we should include information. Well, I guess. What are you guys doing now? You're not open in California. Well, we just. No, we're not open. And we, we did a little bit of um, online classes when we first, you know, went into quarantine, and then we stopped. But just this week, we're starting three online classes. Uh, they're sold out um, now, but we will start some more online classes. My guess is after these cool. end in six weeks. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and then, yeah, as soon as we open. You know, we'll be teaching again. And I'll put all of your contact information on the website and other places so that if any listeners out there want to attend, they can as well. Yeah. Fantastic. For sure. So you got a bunch of people in trouble in school and you learned to juggle and mm -hmm. then you worked for Cirque du Soleil. Like, what did that look like? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, you left out. Uh, no, I think I got 15. it all. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll, uh, we'll see. <laughs> no, later. what did I leave out? Uh, Tell me. Well, my, I, I went, I was, uh, well, now you got me all kerfuffled. Yeah, I, I was juggling in in school. What, I dropped out of college. We'll start there. I dropped out of university. Yeah, yeah, after a year of university in, in Santa Cruz, I dropped out to be a performer, a juggler. My biggest dream was to be a juggler on a cruise ship. Oh, my God. <laughs> what could be better than that? <laughs> Oh my God. My parents were livid that I dropped out of university. But I was lucky because I got a gig. You know, six months later, I was working for the Pickle Family Circus. So I don't know if you know. Okay. About yeah. Them. Gypsy Snyder has been on this podcast. A couple of other people who have worked for the Pickles. Yeah, for sure. Right. So I worked with Gypsy and the Pickles and, not, and others. Uh, that was in 87. I started with them. I was there for four, a little over four years. And yeah, I started as a juggler, but, you know, I learned acrobatics like Chinese pole, hoop diving, and started to learn, you know, character work and, and clown there at the Pickles. Did a little clown, a one-month clown workshop at Del Arte with, with uh, Ronlin Foreman, who was a genius. And he totally, if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be doing this stuff today. So very, very grateful for this guy. Amazing teacher. He also has a brother named Donlin. That's true. Ron Lennon. And Did you know that? Yeah. He was my dance teacher, Don Lennon. Oh, at at NYU? Um, no, actually, um, at the New England Center for Circus Arts. Fantastic. When I was there. Beautiful. Yeah. Never met Don Lennon. Yeah. If he's yeah. anything like Ron, Great he's guy. a good guy. Yeah. And then I was in Switzerland for a couple of years. Uh, also, thanks to Gypsy, really, kind of. There's a, maybe you talked about it with her, I don't know, but there's a. Yeah. Teatro Dimitri and so yes. School Dimitri. There's a school and a theater company there started by a. Swiss clown, Dimitri. And I went and worked with the theater company for a couple of years there, touring around Europe, performed a couple of different shows. This is just sort of the quick fast forward version. And then I was in the States, back in the States for a couple of years. And that's when I was developing, like refining the Coat Rack Act and developing some of the other numbers that I did in Kidam. Mm -hmm. I did for Kidam in 95. And they, oh, here's this something that's interesting. I, um, I auditioned for Kidam. No, I auditioned for Cirque in, uh, in LA in 1995, and they were very interested, but didn't offer me anything for like a year, almost a year. 
They were very kind and always stay in contact with me, but never offered me anything. Alternatively, I got a um, an offer to, to do my act at Circus Circus in Reno. And, you know, not quite Cirque du Soleil, but I was happy to have a professional gig and was ready to take it, move to Reno and take this gig. And I was literally, uh, I had the contract in hand, uh, pen in hand. I was about to sign the contract and FedEx it back to the guy in Reno when Cirque called on the phone, said they want me to come to Montreal Ooh. and do a little workshop for Kidam. And I was able to call this guy in Reno, and uh, God bless him. He said, um, I, you know, I understand. Go go do it. Go do it and let me know. Uh, he let me out of that contract. I, even though I hadn't signed it, we basically had an agreement, you know. Right. Sure. Went to Montreal. I did this two-day workshop, and they offered me the gig, you know, that night, basically. That's so, – I mean, work begets work. This is like the constant thing, right? Absolutely. It's like – yeah. And even when wow. – yeah, when, when – I don't know how people know it, but when you're working, everybody in the world knows it and they want you to work for them. And then they all call at once. And then yeah. when you're not working, nobody gives a shit. And everybody so somehow knows it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then how long were you on Kidam? Forever? Uh, not quite forever. My replacement was there forever, Mark. I was there okay. for three, a th little over three years. I did over a thousand shows. Wow. And I mean, it was the, it was just the greatest experience, you know. It was such a such a joyful experience for me. It was a real real highlight for me in my in my life, and uh, very very grateful for everybody involved who made it possible and 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 who I got to share that experience with. Yeah. Yeah. On that show, you've kind of alluded to this before when you were talking about like you get a young clown in there, you get somebody, and you're like, yeah, but you have to do. 10 shows a week like let's uh let's figure that out you know like what was because i've had other people isabel chasse was on the show and other people who have worked on kidam um it's a very dark show it was a very dark show and um i always remember asking them like how they had the energy or the like how they kept going through that time because it's a beautiful show but what, what does it require to go on stage, especially with something that demands so much, not just physically, but emotionally from you, and do it 10 times a week? For a clown, how was it for you? Where did you find that energy? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Um, th that's, that, is, that is what became the job. So, so mm. the, the act of finding that energy. Right, that was the focal point of the wow. job. You know, more important than making sure I didn't drop a ball, uh, more important than making sure I made my cue on time. You know, all of those things. More important than staying uninjured um, was how do I fucking find the energy <laughs> to go <laughs> and go out there again and invest myself to the degree that I want to be invested. That I that the audience is asking me to be invested, um, and that was what I loved about this show was that it was demanding that investment from all of us, um, that emotional investment. Um, that's what made it a good show is that when we were invested, yeah. all of us, um, that's what kind of allowed that show to transcend. Um, but yeah, man, it's 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 challenging, you know. Uh, I, I had all kind of different tricks and you know that I would employ. Um, so, uh, for example, the weather. I started to really tune into the weather, and I would allow the weather. I would sort of allow the weather to dictate my emotional state, huh. knowing that the audience would be experiencing the same weather outside the tent, and that I would be experiencing the same weather outside the tent. That would unify us in a way. It was a, it was a place for me to unify, connect with the audience, unspoken, obviously. Um, right. So I'd really tune into the weather and I would let that define my spirit, at least my starting spirit spirit for the beginning of the show. Um, that way I felt like I could connect with the audience um, in the pre-show and, and in the opening couple of acts. Uh, and then the energy in the tent would have its own trajectory after that. Sure. 
So a, a sunny day show would uh, would have you know one kind of energy. A, a rainy night show would have another kind of energy. A foggy you know evening show would have another kind of energy. So that was one way for me to vary it and to tune into some sense of authenticity. That's so cool. Um, That's so smart. Yeah. What do you think it was like about that, um, that show in particular? Do you, was it Dragon? Was it the just the cast? Like, what was it that? A, like, because you think about a show that's not so fun to do, and I think part of it is is that you're not committed to it in that way. What was it about Kidam that gave you all that desire for that level of commitment? I think it was a lot of things. <clears throat> um, for sure, Franco. We we at least all the people that I you know was close to and. And I think I think this was true pretty much across the board. Everybody really believed in Franco and the creative uh -huh. team. Um, there was no, there was just no doubt. Like this guy uh, was leading the ship, uh, you know. Uh, and, and from <clears throat> excuse me, from from and not just us in the cast, but Guy La Liberté. I think was not just the cast, but Guy La Liberté. I think was still at that point. I, mean, I don't know if he ever wavered on Franco, but he was. You know, Franco had Guy's support. Yeah. Um, it was the it was more or less the original creative team, meaning choreographer, you know, set designer, uh, costume designer, uh, music, uh, you know, um, uh, composer. Um, so there was that. So that was the rock that was in place, and then there was the cast. Um, which was a phenomenal cast, absolutely phenomenal, and and um, dedicated to each other and to, to to the Franco and the creative team, and Franco understands very well. Unlike other directors I've worked with, for no through no fault of their own, but because he had the experience of it, Franco understands how to work with circus artists, mm. and, and it's not the way. It's not the same way you work a director with an actor. And I can bring this full circle. So that so we were talking earlier about what I teach in class about sort of bringing out this individual. All these exercises that I would I give the individuals, give the comedians. There's nothing that they have to put on. It's just something that they 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 work through like a puzzle, the exercises. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, they, the, the individual emerges through the challenge of this exercise. So I got that from Franco. So by, by relating and, and relating to and directing each of the performers in this way, Franco was able to bring out so many beautiful characters from people, from the, from the performers, from the acrobats. And that meant that we could populate the show with people who had a, a strong connection to the show, so they had a strong connection to their character. And as well, Franco laid a landscape for the entire show. By landscape, I mean a, an emotional landscape, uh, a backstory that, if not everybody, most of the cast could really identify with, sign on to, and be passionate about. Very cool. It was really cool. And Franco was at his peak or just before his peak. So that show, Kidam, was, I would say Franco peaked, his his, his relationship with Cirque du Soleil peaked with O. That's mm. my personal opinion. And Kidam was right mm. before O. And uh, I told him that once. We were having a dinner and I, I said, I, you know, he asked me what I thought of O. And I said, I thought that O was the, um, I can't remember the word I used, but basically the culmination of the work that he did with Kidam. Wow. That, that Kidam was sort of the rehearsal for O. Wow. That Kidam, he made a huge step forward. Not that the other shows were nothing to sneeze at. Sure. But with Kidam, just the emotional tapestry of, of the whole thing and the, the visual aspect of it just went to a whole new level, which then with O, with the building the theater and the, the, this bigger budget and all this incredible, all the incredible resources they had, right. he was able to really completely. Uh, fulfill that vision. Wow. Yeah. That's great. I love the way you brought it full circle too. And I think it's a really interesting distinction working with acrobats and working with artists um, in the physical realm versus working with an actor and a script and the, the theater mindset. Because I know that happens sometimes where a theater director will come in and it, it doesn't work so well. 
I know, and I don't know why they, I just don't know why Cirque doesn't figure that out. It's not that difficult to, to take each new creative team that comes in and say, hey, here's, here's what, you're, what you know, right? You know how to work in a theater setting. Here's what you don't know. Here's some adjustments you can make so that you can, you can be your best. But they never, they don't do that. They just don't do it. Yeah. Shows suffer. And I don't know if the people could make those adjustments even if they did do that. You well, know? I think to an extent they can. I think to an extent they can. Yeah. Yeah. No. Because so often the first, ah, I'm going on and on. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever direct for Cirque? I would love to. If the opportunity. I would love to. I would love yeah. to. Yeah. Dream of mine. I, I would love to. I, I think I've fallen out of favor over there. And I, I just. I don't, well, yeah, they did fire you. They did let me go. And they let me go a second time as well um, after that. So I've got two like strikes against me. Um, mm. so whether I can ever overcome that, I just don't know. Well, I can't wait to find out because it's about to be a whole new ball game someday if they ever reopen. So they will, yes, they will. They will. And uh, we'll, see. we'll see. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I we're about at the end of our time. I do have one last question. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. And I know we talked a little bit about um, – plugging some of your stuff but is there anything else you wanted to uh any resources or anything else you wanted to shout out oh like but resources what do you mean by resource uh like things that you have things that you're excited about things that you're doing or have done that you're like hey here's a link to this cool thing that i did have your people look uh, at it yeah i wish i had more to offer you know we've got the idiot workshop in la and some of it's online or starting, we're starting to do online. So even if you're not in LA, you can start to check that out. We're we're starting. We're just in the very very beginning stages of developing a um, a creative sort of activism wing of mm. idiot workshop. We want to become more socially responsible, and so we're looking for ways to become you know part of uh, the actions that that make change, uh, particularly for Black Lives Matter. Very cool. And so keep your eyes open for that. We've got just a little one page on our website dedicated to that. There's not much yet, but um, if you're inter interested in, in that kind of thing, I think that's something that we can do also branch out to other cities. And we don't have to be in the same city, but if we start to develop uh, actions that uh, are repeatable, then we want to kind of share those to clown and communities around the country yeah. and around the world. So I'm hoping... Um, you know, if you have me back in a year or something like that, <laughs> that I would have more, you know, examples to share with you. But um, that's our, our focus right now. Amazing. That's so awesome. Yeah. Really, really Excited cool. Excited for that. In these times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Final question. <laughs> what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Yeah. Um, definitely. <laughs> oh, you're ready. He's ready. He's just like, yeah, yeah I got I this. This one. So go. I prepared this one. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see a couple of things. Definitely, you know, perform as much as you can, mm. as often as you can. Get on stage. On stage is much more important than in a classroom. <laughs> it's not to say class isn't isn't uh, important, but get on stage in front of an audience. Number one thing. All the people I know who are successful, they're the ones who get up. You know, more than one time a night, even, you know, they're running mm. around, getting up, do it. And yeah, classes are good too. Take a ton of classes, a wide variety of classes, and, you know, respect everybody along the way. Mm. Yeah. And be, be grateful and share, share your appreciation for the folks that you're, you're on that ride with. Yeah. And don't forget that. Nice. Yeah. Well, John Gilkey, I certainly appreciate you coming on the podcast today. You have been a longtime legend in my imagination. So it's very rewarding to get to talk to you. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. And um, I love that you're doing this. I hope you get to just keep on, keep on doing it. It sounds. Thanks, man. It's such a great. I'm trying. Yeah. Totally. yeah. Go, go, go. And I'll, I'll see you yeah. class one day. Maybe. Yeah. If I'm lucky. Thank you, John Gilkey, for coming on the show. It was so much fun to talk to John. I remember when I was a little girl, a little girl, when I was in my early 20s, and I was watching like 
all of the Cirque du Soleil DVDs. There used to be like a box set of DVDs you could get. And if you're an OG, you know what I'm talking about. And I would watch the Kidam one and I would watch him as the clown. And it's just so cool to get to actually like talk to him and get all the like behind the scenes tea about Cirque du Soleil and all that crazy stuff. Something that I have constantly brought up since talking to John is in this interview is when he talks about how as he performed with Cirque and he was doing all of these shows, his job stopped being about worrying about you know, the performance and the ins and outs of like, am I going to trip? Am I going to go to the right place at the right time? You know, like eventually, as you've done so many shows, that all becomes kind of second nature. And John says that his job then became to keep it fresh. So he had done so many repetitions that he was trying to look for the ways to improvise within those repetitions. So he would do things like look at the weather and allow his character and thus his interactions with the audience and everything else about his performance that night to be informed by what's going on in the world, both the physical world and as he talks about with um, Wet Hippo and the Idiot Workshops, how to address what's going on in society right now and continuously change and adapt as an artist. I think that that is... Super cool and such a neat study. And if this were a slightly different kind of podcast, I would like do a whole episode on like repetition and improvisation and how those two worked. And maybe that's a project for a, a bigger budget time. <laughs> if you want to find John Gilkey online, johngilkey.com is his website. The Idiot Workshop is the website for all of his online classes. He teaches along with some of his company members, and they're very cool. Most of them are online, and right now most of them are waitlisted. But go check it out and subscribe to the email list if you want to become a better actor, performer, comedian, or just a circus artist in general. He has a lot of cool tools up there to help you be more creative. Idiotworkshop.com is the place. It's also in the show notes. And as for me, for aerial training tips and inspiration, I'm on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. I'm also on TikTok as the artist athlete. I am on Facebook and my website is theartistathlete.com. And if you love what you are listening to, you want more of it, you want it better, you want it bigger, you want it brighter, go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete and sign up to become a Patreon. It's a super fun place. That's it from me. Talk at you next week, friends, fans, and foes. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, I'm Freya. You can hear my whole story in episode 50 of the Artist Athlete Podcast, but I'm here to tell you about something else that I do. I'm a qualified health and nutrition coach. I help people with sleep and body confidence, among other things. You can see everything I have to offer at wildguidance.com or follow me on Instagram at wildguidance. Hi everyone, I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful Northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website domupsidedown.com. Hi everyone, this is Ali Cooper, owner and coach at the Radical Movement Factory in Santa Cruz, California. I love supporting the Artist Athlete Podcast and the amazing community Shannon has created here. I teach rope and fabric and have a circus conditioning app available on iTunes called Cirque Plus. You can follow me on Instagram at Ali Cooper underscore. And if you find yourself in California, come say hi. Hi, I'm Leah. I hate conditioning. So I created the ABCs of Fitness, a fun, full program of active flexibility, body weight, and cardio with personal daily check-ins to motivate you wherever you are and whatever discipline you do. Join our next 19-day check-in challenge and slide into my DMs on Instagram at ABCs of Fitness. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. 
If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in this city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we have a place for you. 